leads me to my next announcement, which is not a fun one. Um, I just want to pray for that little church in Texas. Um, you guys know. Uh, Father God, we um, lift up that little Baptist church in Texas to you um, right now, Lord. Uh, Father, just heal. Uh, Lord, let your Holy Spirit, um, Father, envelop and surround um, those that are lost loved ones and those that are wounded and are still hurt and hurting. Um, Father, that's it, Lord. I just pray your mercy upon that, Lord. Thank you for the bold statement that that church has made for you and the goodness of you and your kindness. And may we continue on the same. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Yeah, I didn't know, I didn't know what to say about that, but I, um, I did want to mention it this morning for obvious reasons, and I want to encourage you, this week, would you remember to pray for them? That this week you would pray um, for that church in Texas. Um, I was on my way to junior high. I had a really interesting uh, opportunity this week. It was career day at Chiefess Middle School, and they invited me, um, which is the second time. So obviously nobody listened the first time, and by, listen, I meant administrators and teachers. First of all, is there any administrators or teachers from Chiefess here today? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, because I had found out in advance that they, if they tell you there's stuff you can't say or talk about, then you're sort of expected to honor that. But if nobody says anything, you can say whatever you want. And nobody said anything. So the gospel went out at Chiefess this week, which was really cool. More on that a little bit later, but I want to share something with you. Junior high tends to feature, but I had my junior high boy with me in my car, and on the way to school, the question he asked broke my heart. He said, Dad, why would somebody shoot up a church and kill a bunch of people in church? That's a tough question to answer if your 14-year-old asks you that. And I told him, I go, that's a tough question to answer. And I go, ultimately, I don't know that any of us really know. We can speculate um, my, the first thing I thought of, you know, it might be demonic influence, you know, maybe the guy was possessed by a demon and, you know, why, went after church. We knew that there was a domestic abuse case and, I, you know, families and, and relationships cause emotional overload, so maybe it was an emotional overload. Um, it was, might have been a mental thing. It might have just had an actual physical chemical imbalance with a mental thing. Some people would go political, you know, I'm explaining all this to him. Some would say, it's the guns, and others would say, no, the guns made it from being worse, and I, I don't know. Some would say, well, some kids play too many video games, which, of course, I shared with my 14-year-old son. Maybe it was video games, son. <laughs> but I said this at the end. I said, ultimately, you know, there, there is one trait that it seems like all these serial mass murder guys, mass shooter guys, Share it's narcissism, and it's narcissism to the extreme. And, and to explain what that means is, to the best of my knowledge, I can't think of one of these guys that was known for their work in the community. Right? Yeah? They're not known for being people that were giving, that, like, shared their lives and their stuff with other people. In fact, it's usually just the opposite. Their posts usually are like, I've been misunderstood. Nobody treated me fairly. They kind of do the me, me, victim thing. And I want to submit to you this morning that's super related to this morning's teaching out of the scriptures, which is in the book of 1 Corinthians. Now, visitors, uh, the real, real brief summary of, of, of the context of today is because we're in the 11th chapter today. In fact, if you've got your phone or your tablet, pull it out, open up your Bible app, or if you actually have one of those things with paper, you know, open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I think we start in verse 17. I'll have to check my Bible in a second. But remember that the context of Corinth was they were so much like us. The, the world outside their little church was so much like America. The things that they were into was, was wealth and business trade and, and, and pride and ego, power, authority, even celebrity. And they even had like celebrity professional athletes. I mean, it was so much like the world we live in. And, and Paul is, is, is writing to this church that he founded and it's made up the most diverse group of people. It's pagans and Jews and rich and poor, slave and free with like, like 10 or 12 different ethnicities. I mean, all gathered together and they've had all this division. 
And so Paul's whole letter seems to be knock, it, knock off the division. He starts out four different messages we had on why unity is so important, and then he addresses the individual things that were causing division, and we've spent weeks in those things now. And it seems like he's saying, you're bringing in the way of the world, which is to say, what about me? And you cause division, and he says, but our way is not of the world, because to us, he says, the message of the cross which is a king hanging, dying on a cross. He says to those, those out there, they, they mock that, they laugh at that. To, to those who are perishing, they, they mock the cross. But to those of us who are being saved, he says it is the power of God. And so today when we look in today's message, it's, it's ironic, but it's a really sad irony because he's discussing individual issues that are dividing the church. And you know what today's individual issue is? I'll give you a visual clue. The Lord's Supper. The communion. How ironic is that? They had division in the communion. I mean, is that an oxymoron, Alex? Division in the communion service. And that's what they were doing. Not surprisingly, now join me, Chapter 11, verse 17, that Paul says this. In the following directives, I have no praise for you. Your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Oh, no doubt, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. Now, what's going on here? Three different things. He says, this one, no praise. You know how Paul always starts out all his letters with, I'm so proud of you, I thank God every time. I... Nope, not this one. No praise for this one. Coming together with divisions. You have divisions when you come together. Again, it's an oxymoron. Now, by the way, this last verse has sort of thrown people for loops. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. I read a whole bunch of different speculations about what he meant. You know what he meant by that? But you know what my favorite one was? And I think this is it. I think he's being ironic. Did you hear how I read it? No doubt there have to be differences among you to show you have God's approval. It's like because you won the spiritual award. You're so spiritual that you have to show everybody and there has to be division among you. Why? So the really spiritual know that everybody else knows that they're really spiritual. That's my favorite explanation of that verse because we've seen how, God, how Paul has used sarcasm all through this letter and I think he's using it right there. And herein lies the problem. There was a history, and I'm gonna give you some historical context, but let's read the verses. Verse 20, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. Not in this matter. Ouch. Yeah. Well, here's what's going on. Let me give you some historical context. At least what some people speculate, because we don't know we weren't there. But there was rich people in this church, and they were people of leisure. Remember, it's Rome, the rich don't work. And so they had wealthy and not wealthy in this church. And what a lot of people have speculated is that the wealthy would show up for the big meal first with good food. And instead of waiting for the workers to get off work, they just started chowing down and then even started doing the, you know, the Lord's Supper or whatever without waiting. And so those who came later got sort of the scraps and Paul's going, this isn't how you do it. In fact, literally, this is what it means in the Greek in verse 21. In the Greek, it says, each goes ahead with his own supper. You see the inherent problem? His own supper. Not just to, like, bring it up to 21st century or what have you. Imagine, like, I invited you to my house for dinner, which, you know, I sometimes do. And imagine if I invited my friend, Say, where's John P. Mintel? He's my big local friend. I like to invite him sometimes for dinner. And, and I like to do that sometimes. I invite people I don't know, and people I do know, we try to cross-pollinate, you know? And, like, every, you get to meet people in the church. And what if, like, you show up at my house, and I'm doing what I normally do, making my barbecue chicken with um, biscuits. I haven't, it hasn't changed in 20 years. Biscuits, rice, and salad. It's a full carbo load. I hope you're not, you know, averse to carbs if you come to my house. And I'm cooking, and there you are, and John's a fun, entertaining guy, and you're, like, kind of busy talking to John, and all of a sudden you realize I'm not there, and you look, and my wife and I, Tessie, are out on the lanai eating. Awkward. I told you to be awkward today. Awkward. Like, what? 
like that. And, and John kind of looks up like, what are, you, what are you guys doing? And so, hey, well, I guess we're supposed to eat. And you grab your plates and you go over. And I made this great steak, only when you get over there, all the best parts have been taken already. And you're like, oh, awkward. And John's actually getting kind of mad. We walk, you guys walk over to the table where I'm like finishing up. Oh, what's up? And John's like, hey, man, I can't believe you didn't like call us over to dinner. You didn't wait for us. And what if I answered, dude, it's my house. I paid for this meal. What would you think about me <laughs> right there, yeah? What a jerk, huh? This, each one was worried about his own meal. Now, why is that a problem? Keep that in mind, my own meal, myself. Think about why this might be a problem. In fact, I wanted to open up this morning. I forgot to say this, but you know, you know how I always say things like, oh, these are my favorite verses, and you guys go, you always say that. I know, I get it, I do. But I want to say, the next set of verses are the most read verses in this church. They are. They're the most read verses in this church. And finally now, we get to actually see them in context. So remember, everybody in Corinth was worried about what? Their own, their own selves, their own meal. Now with that in mind, let's read what the next set of verses are, 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. These verses are just chock full of meaning. Let me just back up a little bit. Remember we sang God of Wonders? The God who creates the whole universe, and yet on the night he was betrayed. And read into what happens there. When Jesus was like betrayed and they, you know, I want to say handcuffed him, but they tied him and they beat him and they whipped him. Do you, do you think he was thinking to himself, wait, no, stop. Oh, I wish you would stop. Because he's God of the universe. He, he not only allows it to happen, he orchestrates it. He goes like a lamb to slaughter. He could have put a stop to it with one breath, with one thought. He could have just stopped it, but he allow, he's betrayed and he goes. And then he says to the gang there that's gathered, see this bread? Like my body, broken. And then I love this. He gives it to them. He's giving of himself to them in an act of love. And then he takes the cup. Well, you know, that cup has some pretty heavy theological background to it because Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, when Isaiah is prophesying about the Messiah, he talks about this cup of wrath. And the cup of wrath is really when you're disobedient to God and you're outside of the life of God, it's death. And death is the punishment of our disobedience because death is the end result of our disobedience. But then Isaiah says something really interesting about that cup of wrath. Check this verse out, Isaiah 51. This is what your sovereign Lord says, your God who defends his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup that made you stagger from that cup. The goblet of my wrath you will never drink Again, who's holding the cup in that verse? God, Jesus. A lot of people speculate when he was up on the cross and they gave him that bitter wine to drink, that was the moment his kingdom came into full fruition because he drank the bitter wine of the cup of wrath. We get to drink of the cup of grace instead. But are you seeing the all overall gist of this message the whole point of the Lord's Supper is God gave God gave I, I was thinking about this yesterday I imagine when the when the apostles were sitting there at the table imagine they're sitting there and they're probably all clean because it was the Passover meal so they probably put on their best tunic or whatever and they've got all this great food and they're you know you've seen the, the last supper they're sort of lounging and enjoying and Jesus is talking about body and blood and but imagine what it was like 12 hours later as his body was shattered 
And the blood at this point was splattered all over Pilate's courtyard. It was splattered on people that were standing by. Simon of Cyrene, when he went to carry the cross he took for Jesus, he carried that cross and he ended up smeared and blood was everywhere. And suddenly we have a deeper meaning, don't we, into these elements that we call the Lord's Supper of what it really meant that what we were to remember was that, that giving of himself. Now do you understand why there is no place for, the, for a selfish act to celebrate the most giving act in the history of the universe? Which is why Paul can now go off. Let me tell you why it's such a bad deal. Verse 27 to 29. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Can you just pause for a moment and go, ouch? A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. And anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. Ow. Now, funny how, like, we, we get that. Like, we understand to act selfishly, like, before an act of selflessness, is wrong. Isn't it funny how we just know it's wrong? And I was trying to think of examples all day, and I came up with lame ones, so bear with me on this one, yeah? Imagine you get your, uh, your rental car stuck in the sand at Pola Holly. Has that happened to anybody? Because they do it all the, every day. Yeah, you got, okay, yeah, yeah. And some guy in a big lifted GMC comes out, and man, he spends a half hour in the hot Pola Holly sun, gets onto your truck and helps you dig, you know? And then, like, touches a tow rope, burns up half the life of his clutch, pulling you out of the sand. And you finally get out of the sand, and when he's back underneath, unstrapping the hook, you glance in his truck, and you see his wallet, and you steal his wallet. Hey, thanks, man. (laughs) Bye. How is it that we just know that's wrong. And why is it every culture in the world knows that wrong? Did I tell you I, tell you I spoke at Chiefest this week? I did. And a little Chiefest girl asked, how do you explain to somebody that believe, who says they don't believe in God? And I pointed out examples like that. Isn't there stuff in our lives that remind us, what is it about stuff we can't see that we all know? Do you believe in love? Of course I believe in love. Can you see love? No. But you know it's real. Do you believe in justice? Of course. Do you believe in right and wrong? Of course. But you can't see it, but you know it. What is it about us, that, I, that scenario I understand, that, that you understand, that it's wrong? Guy helps you out, you steal his wallet. And let's be honest, you take his wallet, you go to McDonald's, and you spend his money, and you choke on a Big Mac. Does anybody feel bad for you? The scripture, I say, would say, like drinking judgment on yourself. Isn't that interesting? It's like... Wrath is its own, you know, sin is its own reward. It has its own consequences, and everybody gets it that that's right. Now, this next verse can be a little controversial, but I think it's really interesting. Verse 30, that is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Now, you can see why this verse is controversial, because in the wrong hands, oh, I'm not feeling so good today. Brother, (laughs) right? I want to check your internet history. (laughs) I just got a cold, man. I just got a cold. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's actually what that verse is saying, not per se. A lot of people try to explain this verse away. Uh, Some have said uh, the weak means your testimony is weak, yeah? If you live this selfish life only for you, then your testimony is weak and no one's going to want to follow Jesus because you're such a selfish jerk. Yeah, that's maybe possible. But I actually want to go back to that first meeting and, and there might be something to it and, and here's why. I did some research this week. Thank you, Google. Yeah. But did you know science actually has an avalanche of studies that people who are angry, jealous, and bitter have higher blood pressure and die younger. In fact, I found, by the way, Google that if you don't believe me. There's like tons of research. I just picked a couple of my favorites. Here's one from Biological Psychology Magazine, or journal, I should say. 
They found that anger, frustration, and bitterness increased levels of the hormone cortisol, which causes aging. Now, I thought that was interesting because to me, the, the root of all anger and bitterness and, and, and uh, selfishness is, is pride and selfishness. And if that's sin, then the wages of sin is death. Science bears it out, doesn't it? It leads you to a quick grave. In fact, the other thing they found, and I don't know how they proved this, but this is, I'm reading from the study. They also found that people, when they were engaged in the act of forgiveness, that hormone cortisol was suppressed. I have a great name for a new anti-aging cream. Ode of Forgiveness. Forgiveness seems to bring life. Sin brings death. And so maybe there's something to that verse. So Paul says this, verse 31. He says, If we judge ourselves, we would not come under judgment. I just go back to that other verse earlier that said, examine yourself. Examine yourself so you don't come under judgment. And this is important because we always ask you to do this. We, we pass out the elements and we say, now hold on to that piece of bread and hold on to that juice and have a time with the Lord. That is when you get before the Lord in your heart, recognizing that I need this. And the reason I need this is because I sin, because I'm not perfect because I stumble and I fall. And so when he says we should judge ourselves, a man or a woman ought to examine themselves, what he means is this. This is how we approach the Lord's table. Let me read to you from 1 John chapter 1. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But if we claim we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. That is, that is the point of communion. We get before the Lord. And we don't get before the Lord and go, wow, at least I'm not that guy next to me. Because, man, he's really bad, you know? We humble ourselves before the Lord. And then lastly, and I'll wrap up with this verse. We'll have a quick application. And we will enjoy the Lord's Supper today. Verse 33. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, you should all eat together. Now, my original NIV says... When you meet, uh, uh, you should wait for each other. Now, mine says when you wait for each other. That word wait always interests me because did you know in the Old Testament, the word wait doesn't mean like, come on, Lord. Wait on the Lord doesn't mean like, Jesus, it's 930. We got stuff, you know. In the Old Testament, wait is a, is a form of trust. Wait on the Lord means trust in the Lord. And so I was just sort of curious about the Greek word for wait as it came out here and as they said you should all eat together and can, can you put that up Stephanie here's the Greek word ektochamai I did look up how to pronounce it I think I got it ektochamai now this is interesting really interesting word which is why I'm sharing with you because I look at about 10 Greek words and I rarely share them this one got my interest and I think it will you too dechomai de dechomai means hospitality it literally means to like reach out by the hand and welcome in What's fascinating about this word is that prefix ech means away from you. Away from you, welcome in. And when I read that and tried to make sense of it, all I could think of was Jesus giving away his body to welcome us into communion. Do you understand the importance of giving ourselves away and offering in. Jesus offers his body and welcomes us in. But the communion service was never just about our relationship with God. And I will confess to you, as your teaching pastor, I feel I've been guilty of making it that. But the communion service is supposed to actually be receiving the forgiveness of Christ and offering it out. Lord, forgive us our sins as what? It's not one and the other. It's not if, it's not then. It is combined one, and I believe it's perfectly, perfectly stated in the communion service. And so I want to just have a couple quick applications here this morning before we do the communion service to help sort of set us up. One, I want to sort of submit to you a thought I had a couple weeks ago that the line between my temptations 
and evil is really thin. In other words, you know, we pray that, lead us not into temptation, but what? Deliver us from evil. I don't know about you, but for years as I prayed that, I thought, yeah, you know, help me avoid my stuff, but protect me from evil people. And then one day I was praying it, and I realized, this is really interesting, that what might be my temptation might be your evil. In other words, things that I think maybe I just struggle with, oh, I'm sorry, I was tempted, you know, to you might be really evil depending on what my temptation is. I wonder if I could think of a better, better example. Well, I've done stuff in my life, right, where I've struggled with temptation in my life and lust that I think the recipient of that would look back and say that was evil. And my point is this, like, I think it's too easy for us to look and point at everybody else's evil around the world and not take responsibility for at least a little of the evil in the world today. The Corinthians were missing the point completely. They were coming to church to get, get a good food, hear how we've been forgiven, that's great, good stuff, can we go now? And Paul's like, no, because you're missing the whole point. They were coming to church looking to get their needs met. And again this week I was convicted that perhaps I'm guilty of helping foster that attitude in this church. And God gave me a really specific example of how I might be doing that. And I want to share it with you. Do you remember about three weeks ago? I was recruiting people to be a zombie driver for the junior high scavenger hunt. Do you remember that? And I stood up here, and I said, hey, everybody, come on, we need people to help. Uh, we, need pe- we need zombie drivers for the junior high scavenger hunt. Do you remember what I said? It'll be the most hilarious 45 minutes of your week. That's uh, crazy. You get these crazy kids in your car, and they're trying to figure out clues. You're not allowed to speak. You have to just go where they tell you. You go on a 45-minute scavenger hunt. It'll be great. And then I went on the scavenger hunt as a zombie driver, and it was the most annoying pissed off can I say that in church sorry I've been in months I get in the van my wife decided to come with me now I actually thought I'd be smart and pick a group of girls this time the reason why is I I wanted to win you know and I'm like knuckle we've had three years in a row I've had knucklehead boys because the girls that are smart, like what they do is they actually read the clues, they figure out the clues, and then they pick a strategy to go around the poi poo in the fastest, you know? That's, okay, there's no junior hires here, I can tell. That's the strategy. We're not supposed to give them any strategy. But I figured, oh, these girls. So they jump in the car and they start screaming, and like, go, 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 go. And I'm like, and Tessie's sort of being zombie translator. She's like, you're supposed to tell them where to go. Just go, just tell them, go, just go. Follow that car. So I follow this car. We're driving. Tessie goes, you know, maybe you guys should look at the clue sheet. And this one girl snatches up. I'm going to be the clue master. I'm, I, do, I got the clues. I got the clues. What is this? I don't understand any of this. This is all crazy. But she wouldn't hand it to anybody else. Drive faster. Drive faster. Drive faster. And then finally, like other people, she's going, our zombie's too slow. The reason why we're losing is our zombie's slow. What? And then she says this. Doesn't he speak or is he stupid? It gets better. (laughs) Then she insulted my minivan. (laughs) Which, if you know, I'm pretty proud of my minivan. Hey, it's not the Tacoma four-door, you know, lifted long bed sports package. But I love my minivan. But what she said was really interesting. She said, this minivan's so lame, or whatever she said, you know, like only a junior high girl can do. Just cut to the core of you. You're like, ah, she got me, you know. It's like they have a gift, yeah? But what came out of her mouth was, my foster mom's got a way better car than this. Now, I didn't catch it because I was too pissed off, or mad, sorry, angry. We got back here, and they ran out of the car, and I looked at Tessie. I go, do you want to go in and see who won? She goes, no, I'm so irritated. I go, me too. We shut the door, and we drove off. And it was my wife that picked up on it. She goes, you know, I wonder what her life's like. We meant that one girl. 
because she's mentioned foster mom. Now, if you know me, I won the parental lottery. I just did. If you know me, I'm just blessed. I won the parental lottery. Sorry, your parents aren't the greatest. Mine are. Some of you I know had real rough lives and, and lousy parents, and I'm sorry. I, I, I feel actually genuinely guilty sometimes. I can't imagine what it's like to have a foster parent. And then my wife and I began to talk, yeah. I wonder what her life's like based on her behavior, her just desperate need for attention. And I got totally convicted. And then I realized the mistake I made as your pastor. Why was I afraid to get up here and say this? Wednesday night, I need you to come out and be totally annoyed and irritated for 45 minutes. And in doing so, what I want you to do is ekdechomai. I want you to give away yourself and invite in. Because that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's why we run junior high in the first place. To show people the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. And I felt convicted that I would ever stand up here and think I had to like trick you into it by telling you, it will benefit you. You will have fun. Now won't you come? Instead, I should have said, this is going to suck and you're going to hate it. Ek dechomai. And now might be a good time to recruit for Thanksgiving drive around, yeah? <laughs> I'm teasing Melanie. I, I teased it. I'd say that. And I, sorry, Melanie. I, you really will have a good time on Thanksgiving. Now I'm going to have the, let's have the elements come forward. We've, we've only got about 10 minutes left here. But as the elements come forward, I want to share a little something with you from about 25 years ago, long before I ever got into ministry or anything like that. I was a brand new Christian. I had this really crazy dream one time. I was a waiter for years. Uh, raise your hand if you've been a waiter. Have you ever had that waiter dream, the nightmare, the waiter nightmare? You walk out onto the floor and the, everyone's like, over here. I had that dream when I was a brand new Christian, only in my dream, I was carrying two baskets of bread. And everybody was like, here, here. And I put a basket of bread on one table and a basket of bread. I just can vividly remember this dream like it was yesterday. I walked back into the kitchen and standing in the kitchen was one of the elders of this church, a pastor. And I said, we're, there's not enough bread, we're out of bread. And I'll never forget, he pulled two more baskets of bread from a giant stack of bread and what he said was, there will always be enough bread. And you know what? I woke up, and even back then, I got it. We can't out-forgive God. We can't out-sin the forgiveness that Jesus offers us. He's got enough of him to cover our sins, and we can take as much as we need. But do you understand, as we sit here now with these elements in our hands, we need to get real with God. Forgive those who have sinned against us and have a word with the Lord about what we need now to be giving out to ek dechomai of ourselves. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take a piece of the body of Christ, grab the cup of the new covenant that we have in his blood, hold them, do some business with God. By the way, if you're not a believer this morning, you can see why the scripture says let it go. This is for those who understand their need for this. And he says, if you don't understand your need, then you're just putting judgment on yourself. So judge yourself. Reach out. 